Hi, everyone. This is Mike Michalowicz, author of The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, The Pumpkin Plan, and Profit First. And you are listening to Join Up Dots with David Ralph. Keep listening and listen to every episode. It will change your life. Welcome to Join Up Dots, amazing conversation. Join Up Dots, get a dose of motivation. Join Up Dots, don't forget the inspiration. Welcome to the place that's got the light. Join Up Dots, join Up Dots, join Up Dots, join Up Dots. Join Up, join Up. Yes, hello there once more and welcome to episode 15 of Join Up Dots. We've got a guest today that can only be described as a wanderer. Yes, he's a wanderer. Oh, he's a wanderer. Sorry about that. I shouldn't, shouldn't have done that. Anyway, he is someone who from the first moments of his life has been wandering the world. Born on an RAF base in Germany, he grew up in Cyprus and then was reluctantly brought to the United Kingdom by his parents as a teenager. And what was the first thing he did? Well, he instantly complained about the rain. He's a teenager after all. So get over it. That's what we have in the United Kingdom. Was the travelling a chore? Was the moving from country to country the thing that our guest dreaded? No, far from it. The experiences, different cultures and contrasting landscapes embedded a love of adventure, imagery and storytelling that he just knew was something that could take him on a path that was true to his unique self. He loved the idea of being a professional travel writer. So even though he knew his path and knew what he wanted to create, he still only focused on his dream as a side project, until after what he believed was a heart attack, he finally started the action that he needed to kick everything off. Quitting his job, he's now at the time of writing a freelance writer of no clearly fixed abode. So we might find him in the UK, escaping to the Mediterranean, or as he says, even gallivanting across some bleak European hillside bound for disaster which is how he finds material to write about. So let's find out where he is today and bring onto the show the creator of Fevered Mutterings, the inspired, travel-loving blogger, Mr. Mike Soden. How are you today, sir? I'm very well, sir. Thank you for having me on the show. We, we were talking um, just before sort of um, pressing record for this show. Um, we've done so many interviews recently with Americans. It actually sounds strange to hear an English voice on the other end of the, of the line. Um, <laughs> It's, it's kind of making me go, actually, where am I in the place? Well, what, who am I talking to? Where am I? So hopefully I'll, I'll remain on track and I won't say anything like sidewalk when I should be saying pavement and, and things <laughs> like that. And you'll understand what we're talking about. So in the intro, I said to you that we could find you anywhere. So where are you today? Uh, well, I'm actually in the uh, I'm in the north of Westeros. Um, if you watched Game of Thrones, uh, you'll you'll recognize my accent because... Uh, I'm from Yorkshire uh, in the north of England, and that's uh, that's Sean Bean's accent. Um, he's he's from South Yorkshire, but uh, I'm in I'm in that area. And uh, in Game of Thrones, the north, the, the, you know, uh, where there's Winterfell and, and the areas around that, they've taken the the Yorkshire accent, and that's become the the accent that all the actors have to adopt, and that's that's stamped um, the the north of Westeros in in the show. So I'm in Yorkshire. I'm in the north of England, but uh, if you if you watch a lot of HBO TV, you might recognise my accent. So I, I've never seen Game of Thrones at all. Um, is it a good representation of your accent, or do you sit there going, "Oh my god"? <laughs> well, there are there are actors who uh, who are American actors who are taking on this 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 kind of faux Yorkshire accent, and it's it's really fun to listen to them lapsing in and out. It's like listening to uh, Russell Crowe in Gladiator when he's doing that very that very kind of classical English accent, and then he lapses out, and he, you'll just hear this this bit of Australian in the background. So it's it's a lot of fun. It's kind of a, a like a, a an accent archaeology when you're watching the show and, and picking up uh, the various English accents because um, because Game of Thrones, the uh, Song of Ice and Fire, the, the book series, is actually based on um, George R. R. Martin's looking at English history, in particular the War of the Roses. So there's things in the show, there's, there's things like um, there's a great wall of ice in the north in the show, and that's based on Hadrian's Wall, which is uh, the, the landmark that's, that's way up in the north of England. So uh, if, you watch, if you watch Game of Thrones, you will be picking up quite a lot of uh, English culture along the way, which is a lot of fun. 
It is funny that you're actually talking about Russell Crowe because I was just talking to my son. He's got the new film out at the moment, Noah. And uh, oh, right, yeah. every time I've seen Russell Crowe in anything, if, if you see him in Robin Hood, <laughs> and if you see him in, in Gladiator, <laughs> I can't understand yeah, a word he says. He's, he's like a slightly aggressive Scooby-Doo in, in every <laughs> single thing. You, you just well, can't he, understand a word he says in anything. He always has that Russell Crowe accent, and it's the it's the Russell Crowe intonation of everything. All the uh, what do we do in life echoes in eternity, and all that's it's just the same kind of yeah. It's really fun to see. He's one of those actors that seems to have transplanted his voice into every single role that he's done, like uh, uh, Al Pacino, and it, it just he doesn't he doesn't vary his voice, and somehow he gets away with it. Well, we've had hundreds like that. Michael Caine's another one, isn't he? <laughs> Michael Caine is. is always Michael Caine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. That, that, that exactly. Wasn't as good as but your Russell Crowe, but I tried my best. <laughs> so you are a traveller. You're a traveller born and bred. So you, you, you were based in Germany as a baby. And, yes, indeed. And so uh, because you were born on RAF base, I assume that you class yourself as British. You, you don't class yourself as German. Yes, I was born. I was born in a British RAF hospital in in Germany. So, so I am British, uh, but I, I I feel I've got ties with Germany because um, my parents spend spent uh, a great deal of time there. And I I recently got chatting to a travel blogger who was born in the in the, in the small town that I was born in. So at some point, I really want to go back and, and explore those routes. And it's the same. It's the same with Cyprus. I was born. Uh, I was born in Germany. We lived in a British RAF base. But I feel I've got these ties to Cyprus that, that, that pull at me um, because of the time I spent there. So even though uh, nationally I, it's very clear what I am, I've, I've got these, these you know these, these threads that are pulling me from various various points around Europe that I I, I feel this constant tugging and I really want to go and explore and, and dig out my own my own personal history. And that's part of why why I started with all of this really. So, so it's a real strong, almost physical need, is it, to keep sort of moving and exploring? Yeah, I um, I, uh, unfortunately, the the amount of exploring that I've been doing in the last couple of years hasn't been as much as I would have liked. Um, but since, well, uh, over the last ten years, uh, this this kind of need to explore the world and, and really explore my own place in it over the last forty years. Um, has, has been growing and growing and that's that fed into me wanting to become a travel writer and it also fed into uh, my love of storytelling because storytelling storytelling for me isn't just confined to fiction i think i think that the storytelling permeates through everything and it also permeates through the way that you the way that you see your own life and the way that you live that life and you have control over that story and part of part of the story that you'll be living is constructed from the story that you have been living. So the better you understand what you have been doing, and the better you understand your place in the world up to this point, the more chance you have of having having a direct influence, a direct positive influence over the story that you're building for yourself in the future. So, uh, and that again, that's you know that that's using analogies that that really are to do with archaeology. And I studied archaeology. That was that was one of the things I. That's when I went to university. I did uh, I did four years of archaeology, and that that fed into that fed into everything else because it got me really interested in in you know okay it's it's the appropriate phrase but digging deep into things and really trying to uncover look past the, the superficial um, the, the superficial reasonings for everything and, and and really really do what journalists do really really dig deep and try and find those hidden truths about about you, yourself and about the world and about all the all the things that go on in it and about people's motivations. So all these things come together and they've they've led me into a a state of being very very curious and very very passionate about going out and, and trying to find out new things. Uh, and it's yeah it's 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 a lot of fun to to look back and see how all those things have come together to make me who I am now. Okay, the theme of the show is, of course, join up dot, and you summarised it brilliantly there, where so few people do do what you've done and actually reflect on their life, because I'm a great believer on looking back and finding your passions, finding your talents, finding the areas that you've had the greatest enjoyment, and that surely must lead you into 
pretty safe territory that you've got a future that is going to be better than the past you've had. Would you, would you agree Absolutely. with that? Yeah, I, w- I would totally agree with that. I, uh, I, I think as well that one of the, the really, um, really most powerful things that you can do is to, is to go back as far as you possibly can uh, into your own history and pull out the things that you're most passionate about um, before you became a quote-unquote adult, uh, particularly in childhood, because when you're a child, you do things because you don't do things out of uh, out of a sense of responsibility and don't do things because you feel uh, you feel you should. You do things because you want to. You really, really want to do stuff and you, you have these crazy ideas and you often do them. And, uh, and that kind of passion is really... Uh, it's it's really important to discover those uh, those points, those things that will really set you set you alight. And um, because uh, if you're if you're throwing yourself into whatever you're doing with that kind of obsessive passion, um, and if you're being really smart about the way that you manage it, you will have the stamina to get somewhere with it. Uh, I always think I always try and advise people if you if you're doing something, I think the the phrase "follow your passion" is is a dangerous one in in some cases if it's used exclusively. If you're whatever you're doing, whatever you, you've chosen to do, if you if you do it uh, in just a, just in a, in a bubble inside your head without thinking about without thinking about the rest of your life, without thinking about commercial aspects, without thinking about the responsibilities that you have around you, then it can be it can be dangerous. But if you are if you are thinking about it in terms of trying to focus on avoiding things that you hate doing, I mean that's that's the way that I try and look at it. If you if you're doing things in your life and they're not uh, and they're not kind of tapping into those things that, that that deep down you've always loved doing, right from when you were a child. If you if you're if you're not tapping into those things, then you're lowering your chances of getting somewhere because successful people successful people seem to have the stamina to get somewhere because they just they just stick at it longer than anyone else and the way that you stick at something longer than anyone else is that you love it for what it is so i really feel that, that the further back you can go and you the, the more of these things that you can pull out of your your history and the more, the more that you can uh, uh metaphorically or literally get them down on paper so you can see them in front of you and the more that you can you can actually see who you are and then tap into those things, the better chance you have of getting somewhere uh, and doing something that you love. So let's go right back, okay? You were born in Germany, but then uh-huh. you grew up in Cyprus as, as a child. Did you actually realise that you was in, quote-unquote, a foreign country at that time, or did, was that just home to you? Can, can you remember the first time that you actually thought, oh, I'm a traveller? Yeah, I never really... Um yeah, but the, the whole it, it's it's very difficult to pin down the point where I started to think about travel in a way of uh, travel is travel being somewhere that's separate from home because my home was shifting around, and so when I when I go to Cyprus, there, there's a sense of there's a sense of traveling because I'm getting into a different climate and the language is different, um, but there's also a sense of there's, there's also a sense of homecoming, and I've I've only been. I've only been back to Cyprus uh, once as an adult, but I went to Greece um, and I went around Greece and I was, I was, you know, hearing spoken Greek, and there was something in me that was that was really responding to it, and it really felt familiar. And I also noticed since I started learning Greek as an adult, I have the sounds inside my head, and I I was looking at the uh, I was looking at the Greek alphabet, and I was pronouncing things um, the correct way, and I was I was looking at Greek words and. I could hear how they, how they, pretty much how they should sound, even though I didn't understand what they meant. So, with with Cyprus, there's a definite sense of, definite sense of home, uh, and I, I'm really interested to uh, explore that in in Germany. I don't know if I will have that in Germany because I was so young. Um, but and, I, and how I young were you when you left Germany? Uh, oh, it was I think I was about a year old oh, okay. at that point, a year yeah. and a half, something like that. Um, but um, but I, I, I love I love Germany and I, I particularly love Berlin and I've had the good fortune to visit Berlin a couple of couple of times um, uh, over the last uh, both times for a, a travel conference but also just 
for some exploring. And and Berlin is just this this wonderful place. Now it really that felt like home, even though it wasn't it wasn't the kind of home that I remembered. It was a kind of home that I discovered. So my sense of my sense of traveling, my sense of actually being on the move, it's this this constant thing that's in flux. I mean, sometimes I can feel like I'm traveling, and I'm I've gone. I've gone 10 miles up the road on my bike and yeah. that really feels it. Yeah. And it's, it's something that I have this, this constant, constant tension with. I'm, re- I'm really interested in exploring as well because I, I don't feel that people should, uh, I don't pe- feel that people need to, um, go somewhere exotic to feel like they're traveling. There's, there's a guy called, um, Alistair Humphreys and he was uh, national geographic adventure of the year. And he's got a project <coughs> which is called Micro Adventures. He lives just up uh, the road from me. He, oh, really? He, he comes uh, from Dartford, doesn't he? Yes, he does. Yes, yeah. indeed. Which is about sort uh, of f- fifteen miles away from me, really, across across the River uh, Thames. If anyone out there is looking at the map of the UK, you go up the <laughs> River Thames to almost like twenty miles outside London, and then jump across, and that's that's where um, Mike's talking about now. I'm a big admirer of of his his work because he he tries to. He, he tries to bring these these kind of. I mean, he's been on some absolutely absurd adventures that are in, incredibly adventurous, and, and you know, cycling a, a, a across across Europe and all, all sorts of stuff. But really, he's trying to bring these experiences down to people who don't have the time to travel. Travel, you know, in the traditional sense of taking two or three weeks off work. So his micro adventures project is is an adventure that you do within a very short amount of time. Uh, a day or two days and um, one of them that I that I, I did last year which I had great fun with uh, was I I went for a walk and I it, his micro adventure was you have to go for a walk it has to be um, you have to cover 30 miles in a 24 hour period uh, and you have to uh, go swimming in the sea at one point uh, and you also have to sleep out under the stars in a bivy bag so I did this and I, I walked from um where I am now uh, in, in East Yorkshire, a little town called Haunty, uh, I walked up the coast uh, and um, and I I slept in a in a bivy bag. And if you've never seen a bivy bag, it's it's it looks like madness to anyone who who is uh, accustomed to the idea of uh, when you go camping, you stay in something that that keeps the elements off. A bivy bag is essentially it's like a, a bright. It's called a hotel, Mike. Bag. It's called a hotel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, if you're used to hotels, then bivy bagging looks like complete insanity. It looks like a travel lodge. Sleeping... Yeah. <laughs> well, you're, you're just sleeping in the open. You're just sleeping inside a, a sack that will keep the rain off in the open. Uh, and uh, your face is turned up to the stars. And uh, if it rains, uh, well, then you, you probably will get wet. But what you do is you turn over, so the rain just uh, slides off the the back of um, the back of the bivy bag. So, so you look kind and of like sounds... half human, half caterpillar, basically. Yes, absolutely, exactly like that. And it sounds it sounds ridiculous, and it also sounds it sounds masochistic to the point of uh, you know why is this person doing this? They're just trying to get attention. But it, one, once uh, I and I was extremely skeptical of bivy bag technology because i was i i got this thing through the post and i unpacked it and it was so flimsy and i just had this this, this amazing sense of doom uh and um and then i went and did it and and it rained it rained at uh, two in the morning and it continued to rain until six and it rained uh it rained really hard on me for about four hours and i remained completely dry in this thing and it's uh it's, it's a, a bivy bag is a it's like a um well, crude analogy, but it's like a condom that goes over the, the outside of your sleeping bag and then you crawl into it and it keeps the rain off and it, it's breathable. So, um, so you don't, uh, you know, you, you don't get horrible and sweaty and it's, um, and it's actually, if you're, if you have something underneath and you're sleeping on the beach, it's actually quite comfortable. And, and if, I just if doing it, that. Was, if there's any kids out there at the moment that are going, "Mummy, what's a condom?" <laughs> um, please point this um, over to where we'll, we we'll put the contact details at the bottom of the show notes, and Mike <laughs> will answer all those questions for you. I promise you. Oh boy! Well, I asked for that. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and doing that was uh, doing that was terrific, and it was something that I it really felt like it felt like a proper travel adventure, and I was I was you know I was twenty miles away from home. 
Because so, I, I think um, I would have been happier in the rain, funnily enough. I think if I was doing that, my concern would be that it was a lovely night, that people would be out walking about and stumble across me and then do something to me. Did, well, did, I was, did, did uh, you not feel unsafe at all? Not in the least. No, I was, um, I was on the... Uh, I was on the beach, uh, and I was uh, I was just in a uh, kind of a hollow in the with the sand dune behind me, um, or the cliff edge rather. And uh, I just and I could I could see, you know, I had a I had a 270 degree view, and I could see the stars, and it was and I could I could hear anyone coming from a mile off, and it just felt perfectly safe. <coughs> and um, and that that I I think. I think that is also one of the the great lessons of travel. When you start doing these things, you realise you realise that um, there is this kind of self sufficiency that kicks in, and all the all the, all the things that that could go wrong in your head just kind of just boil away into uh, in, into a kind of um, a wariness. Mm. You know, you you don't go out and you don't search for things to go wrong because, and you, you certainly don't put yourself in situations that are inherently dangerous um uh, without without taking lots and lots of precautions but when you do something and you have these worries in the back of your mind and you actually just go out and do it and you just see what happens most of the time um the worries that are in your head are completely unfounded and this is um again this is storytelling because the, the stories that you have in your head the stories that whirl around the things that you worry about a lot of the time they're fiction and we we like to, I, th- I think the the modern world likes to think that um, we can recognise fiction from fact uh, when we see it, but really once you get in, in inside your own head, uh, it's the reality is very very different. And in fact, there's <clears throat> there's a, there's a, a New York Times article um, by uh, by a science writer called Annie Murphy Paul, and the, the article is called "This Is Your Brain on Fiction," and what she found was. Um, she looked at studies taken of people uh, as they were um, uh, as they were reading fiction, and they, the, the studies were of um, uh, of MRI scans of their brains, and uh, those uh, the experiences in the books were compared with MRI scans of people actually having those same experiences in real life. So, for example, somebody would read, um, "She smelled a rose," you know, it smelled rosy, uh, and then that was compared with somebody actually smelling a rose and the same parts of the brain light up so so what happens is when you when you're reading fiction and you're really 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 into it your brain is basically having the same experience as its real life analog so so our our ability to differentiate between fiction and fact is very very blurred because that, that and i think that that yeah. doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Because if you think about anyone, the thing that stops anyone doing anything is the fear of it not working in the first place. And we do. We Absolutely. have these dialogues in our head all the time. Oh, no, it's all right for them. They've achieved it before. Oh, it's not going to happen to me. It's not going to. But once you actually start taking action and you start to limit those fears one of the biggest lessons that i i realized and i kind of always knew this lesson but it wasn't until i started actually being very proactive was whenever something scared me in my head that was the thing that i needed to go for because that was the thing that was actually keeping me in my comfort zone and not allowing me to sort of develop and expand and most of the time once you actually did it and you prepared and you worked towards it it wasn't too bad anyway, because then you get another fear coming up. Oh, right, I'm, I'm to that next point, and I keep on going. And the people that do achieve great things, like you're doing, Mike, because you must have fears um, kind of emotionally, financially, um, location-wise, literally all the time. But by focusing in on those fears and actually conquering them, generally you realise it's not a bad thing, is it? Yeah, absolutely. I... Um I, I always I always think as well that um, if you feel like you've conquered a fear, then it's conquered you because it, it always leaps out and surprises you because you have this kind of this 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 sense of this sense of closure. But in fact, everything that you everything that you worry about takes up takes up a part of your brain. And what you have to do, what you have to do is is, is lean into it and and learn learn to accept it as part of you. And 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 it it's it's kind of training. There's there's a there's a terrific book by um, Jonathan Fields, um, the, um, the American uh, author entrepreneur, 
Um, if you go to jonathanfields.com, you, you can see his work. He's, he's, he's a chap who does terrific, the, the he, good, good Life Project, is it? He does indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that's, that is a terrific show. I, I actually, yeah, I, I download that and I, I listen to it while I'm out for, uh, while I'm out for long walks. And yeah, it, it's, um, uh, it, it's, it's a great show. And his, uh, his book is, is really focusing on one particular aspect of, of living a good life as an entrepreneur in particular, which is dealing with uncertainty and, and dealing with uncertainty and fear and, and these things that traditionally are seen as, uh, are seen as things that you, um, that you, that you need to, you need to kind of, uh, just eradicate from your life and you need to you need to either pretend they don't exist or you need to uh, you need to just beat them into submission but but really the, the, the book is about the book is about managing them and it, it's it's also about recognizing what they mean and as you're saying when, when something when something comes along and you're you're afraid of it that's that's an emotional response to something that is pointing the way to something meaningful because if if it wasn't meaningful you wouldn't be afraid of it so I was, I, I feel exactly the same way you do. If, if there's something and it, it makes me nervous or it, or it just flat out scares me, then I, I feel there's, there's something there and it really needs to be looked at. And it's, it's, it's an indicator of, it's, it may be an indicator of something I need to do, but it's certainly an indicator of uh, something that's attention worthy. I, I read a stat recently where it says only 1% of people take proactive action, just 1%. 99% of the people just generally react to what occurs near them at the time. Um, um, now, that, that's a, a shocking statistic, isn't it, really? That we've, we're all on this planet just once, um, unless you tell me otherwise. And we, we've got a chance to create the life that we obviously all want to dream for, but only 1% actually do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I I always feel as well that um, it's it's very easy when you when you're looking at somebody else that the way that somebody else has carved out their career and and it's it's easy to look at that and and assume that they had a plan um, and and then assume that because you don't have a plan you're part of the ninety nine percent that that isn't um, that isn't finding a path that is that is suitable for you but I. From from talking to from talking to so-called successful people, people I would class as absolutely, absolutely putting the pieces together and doing doing some fantastic things. Everyone's making it up as they go along, which I love. I love that. And and every, by making it up as I, as they go along, I don't mean that they're they're not putting planning in place, um, that they're not thinking ahead, that they're not thinking about their endings as well as their beginnings and middles. Um, I just mean that they are. Um, they are they are in this kind of balance of obviously reacting to things that come along, but they're also making making stuff happen, and they're trying things out and they're experimenting and they're accepting the fact that that, that part of part of trying things out is that a certain amount of them are going to fail, and they're accepting failure as part of the process of getting somewhere. So I I think that and I I think that it's very easy to look at. It's very easy to label people as proactive, retrospectively, um, when you look at their, you know, their success story. I mean, um, okay, an example, good example is is Steve Jobs, who is, who has been extremely, uh, uh, extremely open about his failures, and he's been extremely open about the things that have gone wrong, on on his path to uh, to the, the status that that he uh, that he has and that he had. Uh, and uh, I think the people, the people who are open about these things, they um, other people can read read them as that is a success story from start to finish. But they're not not looking at the detail. They're not looking at the actual the fine grained detail of how a success story is comprised. And, and most success stories seem to be comprised of. Uh, of failures that didn't get in the way of getting somewhere. We, and fact, we only see the highlights, don't we, Mike? Absolutely, yeah. And and if if somebody is feeling that um, that they are they are in in that kind of ninety ninety nine percent of just stuff happening to them, and they're feeling that that sense of powerlessness, I would say um, you're you're not powerless. You're absolutely not powerless. There's all, always something that you can do 
there's always a step that you can take towards uh, taking taking control over uh, over what you're doing and what you want to be doing. But um, the reality is that everyone has to everyone has to deal with this balance of of making stuff happen and reacting to stuff. And nobody nobody is 100 percent proactive. So um, yeah, it's an interesting statistic, but I would. I would I would temper it that way definitely. Well, I, I think it was a perfect segue you bringing in the name of Steve Jobs into the into the conversation because the whole theme of the show is based around a very simple conversation or a, a, an addressment, not a conversation that he made back in two thousand and five. So, um, as I normally do, but you've led it on brilliantly. I'm just going to play that, and then we're just going to reflect on his words and how his words have actually affected your life in any shape or form. Of course, it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when I was in college, but it was very, very clear looking backwards 10 years later. Again, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever, because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path, and that will make all the difference. I love doing what I'm doing at the moment, having these conversations on a daily basis, basis with people. And in many ways, I think to myself, why didn't I do this five years ago, six years ago, or whatever? I couldn't have done because I just wasn't in the place to be able to pull it together or have the realization that it was available to me. Now, listening to you speak, your life almost seems, from my point of view, to have been predestined all the way through. Obviously, it wasn't, but it seems like that, doesn't it, when you sort of look at those connections of being in Germany, going to Cyprus, having an interest in travel, um, wanting to be a storyteller, and just hearing you in conversation. It's quite obvious that you can hold a pub, um, a, a table of people in, in raptured awe for sort of hours and hours and hours until, obviously, the Yorkshire Bitter gets control of you. Um, <laughs> do you. Do you feel that, that, those words are relevant to your life in any shape or form. Yeah, I um, I, I, looking back, looking back at things, I can see that there is this, there is this path that has led me here, um, <clears throat> and I feel, I feel a, a deep sense of obligation to that path. So, it, it's like everything that has happened up to now, is. If I was looking at my life as a story, it would be like I have to continue this plot, and I have to do I have to do the absolute best job I can with this character, uh, and uh, and make things more interesting and ramp things up and make make things even more thrilling. Um, but it, also, I'm I'm aware that there are there are always different interpretations that you can take on uh, on looking back and and looking back at the dots that that led to where you are now. And I'm I'm kind of taking one of them, but I'm but that is that is part of the that's part of the point of taking control of what you want to be doing. You you make a choice. You look back at your 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 personal history and your personal archaeology, and you collect all that data together, and you make you make a choice with it, and you create something with it, and then you you use that to define yourself. And if you're if you're online and you're you're trying to build a presence, then uh, you know that part of that is branding. You know, part of that is taking taking a, a particular story and using that to uh, to reach the world and get the world interested in, in what you're doing. And and to do that, you really you really need to kind of you need to own that story and you need to accept that that story in in some respects is uh, is is filled with things that that are that are challenges and difficulties. Uh, and you know, I've, I I have challenges and difficulties and and i i sometimes i sometimes get twitchy because i my ideal situation would be i would be traveling the world full time uh, and i would have a uh, i would have a, a, an income from what i do that is that is absolutely funding everything that i would possibly want to do and and you know that that would be that would be ideal and the reality is i'm not yet at that stage uh, what i set out to do uh, when i quit my job uh, in 2012, I set out. Uh, I set out to first and foremost find a way to build up an income through writing, doing the kind of the kind of work that I really love doing, and that um, I'm I'm 
getting and um, making considerable progress with that and, and I'm, I'm absolutely loving it and the more that I do the more it fuels my passion for it and um, the other part of the puzzle is travel and I would I would absolutely love to be traveling full-time and have the so-called digital nomad lifestyle uh, that, that some of my some of my best friends have um, and you know I, I, I know people who are who are working from the road and they're traveling traveling uh, around around the world uh, every year and they're living a really good life but they're also living a life that they really they really work at and I uh, I, I love the fact that they they are not resting on their laurels they're, they're really really working to get this lifestyle in place that they really want and I uh, I yeah that that is the situation that I would I would love to be in and so uh, and so that is that is the continuation of my plot and everything that all the, all the dots up to this point uh, I love the fact that I can I can now recognize that they are pointing to who I really am and that I can I can leverage them I can look at the different things that I, I love doing all the, all the things that make my make my writing unique in the ways that it is and make my perspective uh, on the things that I the things that I teach and the things that I write uh, unique so I can I can actually just work on these things and, and get better at it and that is um, yeah that's that's the value of that's the value of this this uh, this process up to this point it, and it, it gives it, me the faith to continue it is so easy in one sense because literally every single guest that I've spoken to have said I, I didn't know what I was doing I stumbled around but then I found the thing that was unique to me and once they found that unique prospect that was in them all the time, that's when everything started to work. That's when they found their passion, as you were saying. And, and that's where, where these conversations are so vitally important because somebody sitting out there in a car um, in Australia or whatever, listening to us having these conversations, they are probably also having those internal conversations with themselves. But because they haven't quite joined up those internal dots between between themselves in this conversation they can't quite see that it's possible but you're saying to yourself yes i can do this because i've seen other people doing it and they're going around the world fully funding so i can do it as well and i think i think it's it's incredibly important to find that unique aspect of yourself and play on that do you yeah yeah absolutely i i also feel that it's it's important to when you, when you see other people doing things that you would like to be doing it's important to recognize um, that they are, they're essentially presenting you with, with the right kind of rules. Uh, in, in writing, um, there, there's there's a there's a phrase that, um, that the, the rules of writing are there to be understood, not followed. And and I really feel, and by by saying that, it's it's saying that um, the people who the people who break the rules in writing, when somebody comes along and they're they're completely new to writing, they don't have a lot of experience. They look at something like, for example, uh, Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Um, it, it can be very easy to assume that what he was doing was uh, was ignoring the rules. But he was just saying those rules don't apply to me. Uh, the rules of writing, uh, I'm going to, I'm just, you know, they, they don't work. I'm going to do something different. What he was actually doing was he was understanding how the rules work of of writing, and he was he was choosing to do something different because he believed he believed that in doing something different, he could have a different impact. So. So I feel this this applies to this very strongly applies to when you look at people online who are offering advice. Uh, in this case, uh, for for traveling the world, and they're they're putting the pieces of their life together. What they're doing, <clears throat> excuse me, what they're doing is they're they're offering uh, they're offering a set of choices. They're not offering a rule book that you have to follow. They're offering uh, a kind of a pick and mix uh, bag of advice. And if you are going to if, if you're going to make a make a path for yourself that is going to be sustainable, that is going to fit you, um, it's got to be put together your way. And you can, all the advice in the world uh, is, you know, all the advice that I, I, I read online, I, I treasure because at some point uh, I find that there is a, there is usually some way to filter that into my life. Yeah. It has to be filtered. It's very important to, to not... Uh, to not look at what other people are doing and assume you have to do it exactly that way because if you do that you will probably fail because you are you and you have to filter 
every single piece of advice that comes to you through yourself and, and make it fit you. And if you if you do that, you usually find that it will fit you in in your way. And that's when that's when stuff gets really really powerful because you are you are furnishing your you're not just taking somebody else's toolkit for for changing the way that you do business or the changing the way that you see yourself. You're you're taking you're ta- you're taking advice and you're building your own toolkit. And I, I feel it's very very important with with everything that's online. You know, just filter it through yourself. And find your unique self and play to your strengths, and then your passion, passion will take it forward. Now, the interesting thing with you, Mike, when and I, I'll be honest, I kind of laughed, and I this is going to sound terrible when I when I say this to you, but when I read about your your heart attack, which mm. turned out not to be a heart attack, the, yeah. um, I I actually laughed because I had exactly the same thing myself. Um, oh. And I thought that I had a heart attack as well, um, which just turned out to be stress, and I felt a bit silly about myself afterwards. But um, why why did it take up to that point when everything had led you to creating this path for you to then go? No, I need to do this now. I'm going to quit my day job because was it simply? Oh my God, I might not have any time left. Was it your mortality suddenly became evident to you, or was it just? A wake-up call. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. It was really. It was a mixture of those things. But what happens when? Uh, okay, one of one of my one of my trademarks online is I uh, I self self depreciating uh, love of disaster, and I when I go traveling, I um I w- I always hope that something something will go wrong enough for me to write about it. One of the last things I wrote about. Um, was going through uh, in 2007. I was going through Paris uh, on the way to Greece, um, and I, I've, I've only just written this up for a website called Maptia, uh, M-A-P-T-I-A dot com, and they they publish travel stories. It's a fantastic site. But uh, when I was going through Paris, I um, uh, I got to um, uh, Gare du Nord, and I was um, and I was I was in you know the main train station in Paris, and I knew that my train was leaving in an hour. And I just got complacent. I just sat there. And um, then with a bit less than an hour to go, I was looking at my tickets and I suddenly realized that that the train was departing from a different station and I had to get across Paris. I just made it because I I was I was panicking the whole way. And it was an absolute at the time at the time it was unbelievably miserable. And I was filled with such self-recrimination. and I was cursing and I got uh, I got my suitcase stuck in the barriers and all sorts of stuff it was just it was awful but it makes a terrific story and uh and what that actually did what that process did of being that that panicky and scared and just just in total mortal fear of this wonderful holiday that i had set out before me just falling apart in front of me uh it just it woke me up and i spent the, the rest of that journey which was um it was a journey by train all the way down to Italy and then across on the ferry to Greece, uh, I was just woken up and I, I saw the whole journey. And that is that that is really the value of having these experiences that, you know, ideally you would have an experience that is so magnificently wonderful that it wakes you up. But sometimes, sometimes the experiences that are, that are negative can turn into positive as well because they wake you up. And that was, I think that was, that was really, um, that was really why this 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 heart scare that I had um, was so important to leading leading me to where I am now because it just woke me up to how much I cared about the, the writing that I was doing and and how much I wanted to give it a go and, and see what happened and 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 fashion a, a lifestyle for myself where I'm not I'm not stuck in a job that I I really am not getting anything out of uh, except money. Um, it just it made me it it made me more adventurous and it made me want to take more risks. So I feel that when when these these things happen, when these these kind of life events happen, they raise the stakes for you, and they they make you they make you think you know what am I what am what am I really doing? What am I really caring about here? Deep down, what is what is really the main plot, and am I straying from it? Um, so yeah, that was that was how it worked on me. And and fortunately, it, it wasn't a heart attack. It was like a muscle spasm or something, wasn't it? Yeah, indeed. I mean, it, it was. Yeah, I mean, I, I've also 
I've had something similar since, so it might be just a, it might be just a, a thing that that comes back now and again. But it's not heart related. I I was sat there on a, uh, sat there on a table, and they attached all sorts of stuff to me, and then they came back and they said it's absolutely fine. And at that point, uh, at that point, it was like it was like a key turning into a lock, turning in a lock, and uh, and a door opening, and all this light flooding out. And I just thought, I can do these things. I can have a go. And and most of these things, most of, most of these things will, you know, most of these things will will work out. Some of them will fail, but I feel like I can really throw myself at this now. I, I have a real strong connection to you as you're saying that because it, it, it you know, this this show's about you, but it would be wrong for me not to just share my experience because I I had a similar similar one. And um, I had what I thought was a heart attack. It turned out to be stressed. And I've always been somebody that never, ever looked like str- stressed at all. I just sort of like go in, do my work and, and sort of float around. But of course, you don't know what's going on inside. And um, I was a trainer and I was doing a training course. And I look back on it now and I think it, that was really fascinating and slightly weird, really, because it's, it's the nearest I've had to kind of out of body experience where I was doing my um, training and I was up on the whiteboard writing away. I can't remember the subject I was doing it was insurance based so it's probably the data protection act or something like that and suddenly i had this pain in my heart like it, it almost doubled me up and i thought oh my god i've just had a heart attack because as far as i'm aware any pains in your heart was a heart attack that that was end of story but looking back on it now the sensible thing would have been to say to the classroom excuse me i think i'm unwell um i'm gonna have to stop this course but i didn't i carried on doing it and my my body split into three parts. There was one that was doing the training still. There was another part of me that was going, oh my God, I'm having a heart attack. What's the symptoms of a heart attack? Is it a pain down your left arm or your right arm? Have I got a pain in my left arm? Have I got a right arm? And I was kind of sort of diagnosing myself. And then the third part of me, kind of, this was the outer body bit, kind of went, this is amazing, this. You're still managing to train. You're still doing your job, but you're actually diagnosing yourself, you know. And it, it was like these three dialogues going on at the same time. Um, and I sort of went out, f- finished off the class, went out, and um, my manager said, you know, you're right. And I said, yeah. He said, you look a bit pale. And I went, oh, that's all right. I'm just a bit tired. And then, bang, another one hit within about sort of 10 minutes. And that was the moment I thought, oh, my God, I'm not going to see my kids grow up. I really thought it was like the end end of my life. Um, as I say, they put me on a monitor for a few days and all that kind of stuff, and it just turned out to be stress. I had to sort of relax myself internally. But that was my wake-up call, really. When I look back on it, I think that was the moment when, since then, I quit my job, I've started doing this business, and I decided that if I'm only going to last another five or ten years, hopefully that's not the case, I'm going to try and make those as authentic to myself as possible and it's not worth going into doing a job that you're just doing for a pay packet and it doesn't really fulfill you anymore mm-hmm. and um i look back on that and i actually think no that was a good thing that that brought me to my senses and took me off on a path that wasn't fulfilling me in any shape or form and actually was detrimental to my health mm, yeah that's a fascinating story yeah i um I, I i feel these things when they come along they are Obviously, very difficult to to deal with at the time, but but they're all they're always um, the, these repercussions that, that wake you up to yourself and they wake you up to the, the things and the things that you you d- you don't think about when you're uh, when you're in a, a comfortable state. And you know, comfort is comfort is obviously something that it, if if you're not interested in being comfortable, then you're a little bit crazy. But at the same time, if you have too much comfort. It, it actually it files the edges off off your you know your your, your true ambitions yeah, yeah. and um, and you 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 forget yourself and I think that um, I think listening to yourself and remembering who you are is is really any anything that that triggers that is a good thing very much so well that's a part of the show and once again you're you're doing you're doing a better presenting job than I am because you've done a perfect segue there of saying you need to remember yourself. And this is the end of the show where we call it the sermon on the mic, or as I like to call it today, mic on the mic. And this is the bit where I'd like you to basically go back in time and speak to your younger self about your experiences, um, about your um, challenges that you've overcome. And really, it's your opportunity to give some advice to them on how they could make life 
if only you could um, point them in the right direction. So the music's going to play, and when it fades out, Mike, you're on the mic. Here we go with the best bit of the show. The sermon on the mic. The sermon on the mic. Hello, Mike. Uh, you're a nerd, uh, and that's great. Um, I know. Uh, I know that uh, you're you're feeling a little out of place at the moment. Uh, you're you're spending most of your time reading. Uh, you've got all those copies of National Geographic fanned out on the floor that you're picking through every day instead of being out playing football. But that's fine. That's exactly what you should be doing. Um, and I. Okay, I'm talking to my, my, I would say, myself when I'm in Cyprus uh, at this point. And myself back then, I, um, yeah, I, I was, I was very much a nerd, but I was a nerd before, um, before the kind of the computer generation nerds came along. And then I became a computer generation nerd. I, um, I got fascinated with home computing. Um, I, I played video games, everything that, that, Everything that a particular generation that is now very successful on the internet will recognise, uh, and back then it was, it was, it was, un, it was weird. You know, I was, I was weird, and I felt weird. I felt weird because I was doing things that weren't the norm. Uh, when I when I left school, I wasn't interested in, uh, I wasn't immediately interested in learning to drive. Uh, I didn't plough lots of money into learning to drive because it just didn't. It didn't hook me the same way as getting up my bike, and that was weird. And I think that um, as you're as you're going uh, as you're going through life, and you're finding these things that you're very passionate about, it's very very easy to feel that those passionate those things you're passionate about are weird in a bad way, but they aren't. They're weird in a good way, and they're probably weird in a way that will uh, become incredibly cool some point later. And this is the wonderful thing about the internet: it has turned nerdiness. Uh, into a benefit, into a positive force in your life, and uh, and it has unlocked an incredible amount of creativity from a generation of people who had gone who had gone into themselves, who had gone gone in, internally, uh, and and explored a lot of uh, explored a lot of passions that they had for technology and for fiction and for you know things like Dungeons and Dragons. You know, I mean, if you think if you think back twenty years about about the whole fantasy fiction D and D thing. That was as nerdy as they come. And now Game of Thrones and now Lord of the Rings and now all these things. Uh, and you look at the same thing with computer games. Computer games have informed this current generation of uh, technology. You know, apps use apps use the same kind of triggers uh, as computer games use the whole leveling up thing. You know, this is this is normal business for humanity now. And I feel that uh, if you're you're looking, uh, if if I was talking to myself back then, I would say that the things that you're really really interested in, the things that you're really passionate about, you need to hang on to those. You need to do more of them. And I I feel really lucky that I wasn't dissuaded from doing these things at an early age. But I could have done more of them. I could have I should have been writing a lot more back then, uh, and I I should be writing a lot more now. But um, but that's you know that that is part of the ongoing challenge and do more of the stuff that you're good at and that you can get better at uh, and if i was also if i was looking back to myself uh, about about 5 6 years ago i would say when i started looking at advice online and i started thinking about possible ways i mean it, when i when i when i started writing um, for money um, getting paid over the internet for money back in 2000, early 2008 it blew my mind. I have no idea that you could do this. You can make money from this? What? Um, but back then, I just I, I got addicted to reading stuff about life hacking, essentially, reading stuff about business and about people using all these different ways to, uh, to change, their, change their futures and do the things that they love and make money, doing stuff that, that fulfills them in a, in a, in a deeper sense than the work that they're, they're currently doing for other people. Uh, and I got, um, 
I was just reading a lot of this, but I, I, what I was doing was I was accept, I was looking at these things as rules. And as I said a little earlier, if you do that, then you will feel powerless because other people, other people are doing these things with a different set of circumstances, different resources. They may have, you know, it's not not just about money. They may have more money to do things, but they are doing things with, with you know, they have different brains, they have different skill sets. But what they are doing is when they're putting this advice online, they're showing you that they're showing you how you can take some of what they've said and then change it so it fits you. They're not telling you how to live your life. And I, unfortunately, spent rather too much time uh, assuming that they were telling me how I should live my life. And in, in doing that, I was I was getting fed up because I wasn't living my life like that. And I was I was reading the, this advice the wrong way. And as soon as I started realizing that all this all this advice is, is nothing but advice. It's just things that you can try out and things that will work for other people may not work for you. And that is fine. And the process of doing that, the process of trying it out and having it fail on you will teach you something valuable. So um the the me of five or six years ago, I would say, you know, keep reading this stuff. Keep 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 working your way through all the all the stuff that is coming out of um okay, copy blogger is a great example. If you want to learn to write, if you want to learn to write effectively, if you want to learn to tell stories in an effective way that, that really hooks people, then you need to read you need to go back and you can sign up to um I think copy blogger have something called my copy blogger, which is or you sign up to their newsletter, um, and it's my.copyblogger.com, I believe it is. You sign up to their newsletter, and you get access to um, repurposed content from their last uh, their last four or five years, uh, and their are e-books. It's a bunch of, I think it's 13 or 14. And if you're learning to write, these e-books are invaluable. They're absolutely fabulous. They're beautifully written. But more than that, they're, you know, they're really smart about learning to write effective copy that really works on people um but all these all these books are doing is giving you advice that you can giving you things that you can try out and uh, as soon as as soon as I, I got that into my head and i started trying things out instead of just accepting that i couldn't do these things because i wasn't them i just tried stuff out my way and these things started to work so i would say to myself back then you know try out more things uh, and just experiment. And ex experimenting is, is experimenting is everything. You're making stuff up as you go along because you experiment. And when you experiment and things work out, you unlock more and more of the, of the, the future that you would want and the, the future that excites you. So that would be my advice. Mike Soden, it's been an absolute delight to have you on the show today. You've been so generous, open, and of course talkative. And you, I really wish you the best for the future. And just listening to you talk, I know that you, you're going to go on to be an absolute you know, legend in writing. I don't know if it's going to be blogging or it's going to be novels or, or what it's going to be. But I just, oh, you, I just know that you've got a talent for that and it, it comes across on the mic. You're, you're just going to put it on the page and, and shine a light over the literary world. So thank you so much for being on the show. And um, as I say to all our guests, you always um, there's an open door here. If you ever have got anything you want to share or any sort of um, successes you want to sort of um, add on to your connection of joining up the dots, just give us a call. We'll get you on the mic because joining up those dots is the only way to build our future. Thank you very much, Mike. My pleasure. Thank you. That's the end of Join Up Dots. You've heard the conversation. Now it's time for you to start taking massive action. Create your future, create your life. It's the only life you've got. And we'll be back again real soon. At join Up Dots, Join Up Dots, Join Up Dots, Join Up Dots. Join up dots. Join up dots.